so, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, good evening. Uh, on behalf of the Medartis, I would like to welcome you to Webinar Wednesday and thank you very much for joining tonight's session. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. A warm welcome to Dr. Pascal Hannemann from Maastricht in the Netherlands and to Dr. Philipp Honigmann from Liestal in Switzerland, who will uh, discuss advantages and challenges of dorsal plating on the distal radius. Just before we start, a short comment from my side. To ensure the best streaming quality, I would like to ask you to keep your microphones on mute and your camera switched off. Please feel free to ask questions anytime in the chat box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer them at the end of each presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the MedArtist YouTube channel over the next couple of days. So again, thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. And now it is uh, my very pleasure to hand over to Pascal, who will start with his part of the presentation. There you go. Thank you. Let me share my screen and we can start. Okay. Is this being seen everywhere? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I would like to thank Medartis for the invitation to be able to do this presentation today. It's a privilege to be able to speak for this topic so thank you again. Um, and I would like to discuss in the next 20 minutes the indications for dorsal or volar approach in distal radius fractures or even a combination of both. So these are my conflicts of interest. Nothing very spectacular over there. So let me shortly uh, discuss the learning objectives of today. I will be discussing the fracture pattern characterization and the importance of that when treating distal radius fractures. And we are discussing uh, about intra-articular distal radius fractures. And I will be using a recently introduced pragmatic and quite easy concept called the four corner concept to do this characterization. And eventually we will be discussing cases in which we will see whether a volar or dorsal approach is appropriate. Um, I will give you some examples of fractures that are difficult or in my opinion, uh, impossible to solve from only volar. And we'll be discussing disadvantages and complications of both approaches, dorsal and volar, and the um, pros and contrasts of both. I will not go into technical tips and details. Um, um, my, my fellow Philip will discuss on that, but um, we will certainly, in the discussion, uh, see some things uh, interesting to, to, to discuss. So let me start off with this case. This is a 44-year-old female with this bilateral distal radius fracture which was treated in a uh, similar fashion. But as you can see on the left side, there is a dislocated dorsal ulnar corner fragment, which is not present on the right side. So obviously <clears throat> there's a little difference of, uh, between both fractures. However, as I told you, both fractures were treated in a similar fashion using a volar angular stable uh, plate. Um, uh, but however, there was on the left side some doubt regarding the position of the most ulnar place screws. So a CT scan was made post-operatively and on the right side, there was a fairly nice reduction of the fracture with a, um, a, a congruent distal radial ulnar joint. On the left side, however, there's a persistent dislocation of the dorsal ulnar corner with the screw penetrating the distal radial ulnar joint. So in, in, in my perception, um, this fracture is not particularly suited for a volar approach. And um, the result is probably um, due to the fact that a volar approach is not the best suited approach for these kind of fractures. And obviously this patient had functional limitations. There is a significant loss of flexion. There's a loss of pronation and a significant loss of supination. So there are, there are severe functional limitations due to the malposition of this fracture. So uh, this case shows the importance of the characterization of the fracture pattern. And in my view, the key to success is to understand the fracture that is absolutely essential. And we've all seen these kind of folar dislocated fractures and we look at the X-ray and we think that this is a typical case for a volar plate and it looks quite straightforward. However, if we do a CT scan and we do a coronal, a sagittal and transversal reconstruction, we see a completely different image with a lot more information. And we will be informed about the position of the fragments regarding to which column they are. We will be informed about the, the articular congruity or the absence of that. And last but not least, we will get a lot of information regarding the size of the fragments. Are they suited 
for fixation with plate and screws and are they possibly large enough? All this information cannot be given by just an X-ray. And this is for me a way to make a very detailed operative plan. This is the way we usually work. And in the, uh, in, in the end, we will come up with the fragment specific and patient specific fixation in which this fracture was fixed like this. And I'm sure that this is a lot easier if you have a detailed plan made by CT scan. So let me take you to our experience in our center, what this has influenced our practice. Let's take 2019 because 2020 obviously was not a very um, good year to do uh, statistics on. Um, of all fractures we operated on, distal radius fractures, in 35% of cases, we used a volar approach. In 28% of cases, we used a, a fragment specific dorsal approach. And in one third of all cases, we did a combination. And obviously there's sometimes an indication for something else, external or internal fixation, that's just 4% of all cases. So if you look at these numbers, we can conclude that in 61% of cases, we do use some form of dorsal approach, which is in my opinion, quite a lot. So we have quite a low threshold for some form of dorsal approach. And we think it is often appropriate and it often makes sense. So let me take you to some reasons in which I think a dorsal approach makes sense. First of all, and I will all discuss on them briefly, is the key fragment. The key fragment is, is essential to de decide on which uh, approach is used for which fracture. The second one is the advantage, which is biomechanical for a dorsal approach. I will go into that in detail. And there are sometimes fractures in which a volar and dorsal corner are present and in which the volar and dorsal corner are both equally important. Then it's impossible to decide and both corners should be addressed. And then there of course are uh, in some cases, uh, fractures in which a central fragment is depressed, the so-called diaperance fragment in which a dorsal approach could be appropriate. Last but not least, I will not go into detail. Sometimes there is um, uh, a carpal injury that is uh, concomitant and needs to be addressed. And often this is done via dorsal approach. So let me start off with the first one, the key fragment. The key fragment is actually um, uh, something that was introduced uh, when the four corner concept was introduced in 2016 by my predecessor by our center. They published this article in 2016, and this is actually a very easy and pragmatic classification system for intraarticular distal radius fractures. I will shortly um, explain what it is about. And as you can see, the CT is essential. Uh, that's the reason it's in the Dutch guideline. It is impossible to do a classification adequately without a CT. So this is a CT-based classification. And this four corner concept is actually not that new. If you look at the classical fracture pattern that was introduced by Malone in 1984 in the Bone, Bone Joints Journal, in which there is a radial shaft, a styloid radial fragment, and an anteromedial and posteromedial part of the lunate facet, you can see this form of uh, uh, space. And this is actually a translation into the recently introduced uh, four corner concept in 2016. So let me short, uh, shortly um, explain. This is your typical intraarticular intra distal radius fracture. This is your transversal view. And you can see clearly the four corners. There's a large volar corner, which is usually with a thicker cortex, uh, usually supinated and uh, shifted proximally. There's usually a smaller dorsal corner, which is fragmented, thin cortex and um, comminuted. There's a radial corner, which is usually supinated and transferred ulnarly, and there's an ulnar corner, in this case, not involved. So they are your typical four corners that need to be addressed. So um, a, a specific approach is then dictated by the key fragment. And the key fragment is the fragment that is in uh, relation with the lunate. In other words, the lunate will sometimes dislocate or subluxate to one direction. And the direction the lunate goes to is actually the key corner. So this is an example. You see a volar dislocation of the lunate in this case. So obviously this volar corner is, is the key corner and needs to be addressed. And in this way, in this case, it is a volar approach. That is clear. So this is another example, 24 year old male with this uh, typical intraarticular distal radius fracture. And this is the CT scan. You can see a large dorsal corner. And if you look at the sagittal view, you can see that the lunate is slightly displaced posteriorly. So obviously this dorsal corner is the key corner, which is quite clear because it's the only corner involved. 
But due to the fact that the lunate is displaced posteriorly, this must be the key corner and it must be addressed accordingly. So schematically, it looks like this. So this corner needs to be reduced and then fixed in this way, a dorsal fragment specific plate. And due to the fact that the radial corner is also involved an additional radial fragment specific plate. So this is your post-operative situation. And as you can see, alignment is corrected nicely. Here's another example, a little bit more complex fracture, a clear dorsal dislocation, and there's your CT scan. You can see a dorsal corner with this dislocated dorsal ulnar corner fragment. And if you look at the sagittal view, you can clearly see that the lunate is again the key corner, the dorsal corner, because the lunate is displaced posteriorly. So this blue dorsal ulnar corner is the key corner. So in my opinion, this is the schematic view. This is an ultimate indication for a dorsal approach. This patient was treated elsewhere, and as you can see, the surgeon involved chose for a volar approach. So he tried to reduce this dorsal ulnar corner through a volar approach. And um, this is the schematic view. But if you look closely, you can see that there's some doubt regarding the position of the dorsal ulnar corner. And indeed, this is the post-operative CT scan. You can see a persistent dorsal subluxation of the lunate and a persistent or maybe secondary dislocation of the dorsal ulnar corner. And in my view, these fractures are not particularly suited for a volar approach. So this patient, this is the schematic view. This patient was referred to us and we did a um, reconstruction. We removed the plate. We did a dorsal approach. We buttressed it uh, via a dorsal approach and used this fragment specific dorsal plate in which it schematically looks like this. And in my view, this is a much more appropriate um, approach for these kind of fractures. This is the post-operative CT, CT scan of the same patient. And you can see a nicely reconstructed distal radial ulnar joint and a nicely reconstructed radial carpal joint. Um, of course, this also goes for the volar corner. It's your typical volar dislocated intraarticular distal radius fracture with a volar subluxation of the lunate or volar position of the lunate. So obviously this volar corner is the key fragment. So this, this should be reduced and fixed accordingly. And this is the post-operative view. So the same principle is of course present for the volar corner. So this is one reason to uh, consider a dorsal approach, the key fragment that is located dorsally. Another one in my view is uh, some sort of biomechanical advantage for many fractures. If you look at your typical intraarticular distal radius fracture, you usually see a large volar fragment, which is usually not combinated, but you see several thin cortical dorsal fragments that are usually, uh, there's a usual, usually a lot of combination. So it does not make sense, in my uh, opinion, to, to pull these small fragments towards yourself via dorsal approach. It does make a lot more sense to use a buttressing type technique to push these fragments in their way. So from a biomechanical point of view, there's also a big advantage in a dorsal approach. So this case, 60, 46 year old male, you can see that the lunate is slightly, uh, is nicely in the middle. So there is no actual key corner, but you can see that the complete articular surface is displayed posteriorly. I excuse for the bad quality CT scan, but uh, the complete articular surface is displaced posteriorly. So this is not a question of a key corner. So and this patient was operated uh, somewhere else and the surgeon tried to reduce this fracture via a volar approach and tried to pull the fragments towards himself. Although quite long screws were used, initially this looks sufficient, but after six weeks, you can see a dorsal subluxation again and the CT scan shows a persistent or secondary dislocation of the complete articular surface. And now there is a dorsal key corner, so an additional dislocation of a dorsal key corner fragment. So uh, we were, this case was referred to us, we did a reconstruction and we used a dorsal buttressing fragment specific plate as you can see here, but we also buttressed the volar cortex because there was no adequate volar support anymore. So this is a nice example in which a dorsal approach does have uh, an advantage uh, from a biomechanical point of view. However, we needed to support additional the volar cortex. So we use uh, some sort of sandwich technique uh, to fix this fracture. So that's the biomechanical advantage. Then there are these kinds of fractures. So there's a dorsal corner which is involved. 
and there is a quite large volar corner which is involved. And although the joint surface looks congruent here, if you go further uh, only, you can see a big gap and a step off in the joint. So both corners, in my view, have to be addressed. And it's impossible, in my view, to do this from one side. So both corners do have to be reduced adequately and do, be, do have to be fixed. So this, in my view, is an optimal indication for a volar and dorsal uh, combined approach in which the volar plate was uh, fixed first and then from dorsal it was reconstructed. This is your six month follow up. I agree there's a lot of material in and the dorsal inner corner plate is somewhat rotated but uh, um, again the, the articular surface is nicely reconstructed and the functional outcome of this patient is quite excellent. So we were very happy with the results and I think this is a case in which anything else but a double volar and dorsal approach would be, at least in my experience, uh, problematic to reduce this joint surface uh, anatomically. So then, uh, last but not least, the die punch fragment is uh, an x-ray that looks quite okay, but if you make a CT scan, you can see this central depressed fragment with this dislocated dorsal corner, which is actually the key corner, because you can see that the lunate is displaced posteriorly. And we use this dorsal corner to lift it up, to take a look at the fracture. We open, reduced this fracture. We checked it via a dorsal arthrotomy, the arthrotomy then closed it again with this dorsal intermediate column plate. And then additionally, we did the radial column fixation. So again, um, a very good indication in my view for dorsal approach, these kind of, um, uh, depressed central fragments. This is your post-operative follow-up and the CT scan shows a nicely reconstructed articular surface and a nicely reconstructed joint again. <clears throat> Here's another example of a die punch fragment. It's not displaced as much as the previous one. And this is tricky because here's a volar corner fragment. So what we did is actually a volar approach to reduce these volar fragments. And we did an additional mm, mini arthrotomy via dorsal to reduce this fragment from dorsal. And we closed it with mini screws. So again, a very small additional dorsal approach to reduce it. And uh, as you can see, there's a quite nicely reconstructed uh, articular surface. <clears throat> so these are the advantages of a dorsal approach uh, as a um, a primary or an adjunct to a volar approach. And of course, there are some disadvantages. Surgery is a little bit more demanding. Um, I'm sure that Philip will discuss that in his talk, so I'm not going into detail on the uh, technique and tips and tricks. And the second thing you need to consider is that the volar cortex has to be intact. So the metaphysical contact of support has to be present. In other words, the fulcrum or rotation point should be intact. Let me uh, explain that with a case. There's an extra articular or partially intra articular distal radius fracture. And since we do uh, work in an institution that are really uh, fond of a dorsal approach, this patient was approached dorsally. But you can see at the preoperative x-ray that the volar cortex is not supported by the metaphysical cortex and the volar side. And postoperatively, the same is the problem. So although the reconstruction looks quite nice on a lateral view and uh, the angulation and the articular surface look good, you can see that there is no support for the volar articular surface. So the met metaphysical bone is not in contact with the, with the distal part. So there's no rotation point, which is good. And this is the result. There's an increasing volar angulation with eventually non-union and the failure of, this, uh, uh, of the implants, obviously. So the problem here is that the volar cortex was not corrected. And that is something you should consider when you do uh, a dorsal approach. And there are several options to do that, to, to, to make sure that that volar cortex is supported. The, the first one is still via the dorsal approach, make sure that the fulcrum is uh, co uh, uh, created on the volar sides. So for instance, you use K-wires to make sure that the volar cortex is nicely supported and then do your dorsal approach as you are used to. So this is one way. And another way is, as you can see in this image, the fulcrum was not supported and there's a lot of tension on the dorsal plates and you can still see a lot of movement and an instable volar situation. And the, the, the second trick, which is quite easy, is to add volar support by using a volar plate. This is of course quite large plate, but um, it, when you start and you correct the volar surface first, 
then you do your additional approach from dorsal, you have a very stable situation. And I have a small case to illustrate that. Join your female forward pike, you can see a clearly dislocated dorsal corner, which is the key fragment, obviously, because the loon is placed dorsally. And there's a large volar corner, which is rotated. So if you do not correct this volar corner and do it from dorsally, there's a big chance that this will fail in the end. So what we did is we constructed the volar part first. We used a smaller type of plate, and then we did the dorsal reconstruction uh, afterwards. So again, this is a sandwich type of a, approach, but post-operatively, you can see nicely that the joint surface height, angulation, inclination, and translation are nicely corrected. And this is the functional outcome. So in my experience, a additional or a um, uh, uh, first volar approach to correct the volar cortex is essential in many of these cases. So what about complications? This was advantages. There are several series in literature. We uh, published a series in 2016 and we reviewed 212 uh, distal radius fractures, which we approached volar dorsally. We approached 91 volar, looked at these kind of complications, tendon complications, neurological problems and also soft tissue problems. And we looked at 123 dorsally approach fractures, looked at complications in none of the categories and, and not in the overall complication risk, we saw any significant difference. So from the complication point of view, there is not a reason to not use a very low threshold for dorsal approach. In other words, it does not lead to more complications. And for some complication, that is my um, absolute uh, experience that it leads to less complications even, but there's no proof for that in literature. So what are my take home messages? I think it's essential to understand every intraticular distal radius fracture. Make sure that you do a CT scan in every intraticular distal radius fracture that you completely understand all fragments. Think in corners, try to define your key corner if that is present and approach it accordingly. There are fractures in my view that cannot be uh, solved adequately only from a volar side. Do not imp neglect important fragments. So it's important to reduce them, but also to fix them. So an additional dorsal approach for fixation of essential fragments is important. Complication rates are the same. So there is no reason to get familiar with a dorsal approach. Thank you so far for the attention. I will unshare my screen now. Thank you very much, Pascal. Um, we have we do not have any questions in the chat, so I would like um, to give the word to Philip. Please unmute unmute your microphone. Yes, hello, and we're happy to hear your comments. Hello, everybody. I hope you have a success. You had a successful day today. Um, I would rather start with my presentation, and then we have a discussion afterwards. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. Um, then let me share my screen and start with the presentation. Is this seen? Yes. Okay. So my tips and tricks are basics and also advanced tips and tricks. I hope there's something in here in this presentation for everybody. So I have a conflict of interest, um, otherwise I wouldn't be in here. Um, I have a, I'm a consultant at the MedArtis. So maybe you've seen this today. Um, this was maybe your, your um, resident showing you the, the pictures of a fracture today from the emergency department. And this is what we encounter every day, um, just some x-rays. But for the fracture assessment and the understand, uh, to understand the fracture, like Pascal said already, you have to read the fracture, understand the fracture pattern and its characteristic and interpret them. Then you have to make up your plan, um, a good plan, come up with plan A, plan B, and maybe use plan C. Um, and you have to do it before the surgery to have a good plan intraoperatively and maybe chance, uh, change plans intraoperatively. Fracture assessment, um, just to add an information, um, I'm absolutely with Pascal's comment that it needs to be a computer tomography um, assessment. 
Sometimes you have the multi sliced in the in, in your hospitals, but you can also use the cone beam CT scan, where there is um, a difference in in X ray um, dosage. Um, but the, the pictures and the, the assessment of the bone bone quality is is nice with the cone beam CT. This is the cone beam CT, and it gives you a, a good view on, um, about the characteristic of the fracture and to understand the bony part of the fracture. And also use the assessments we have in the modern times. This was in the 90s, where we had uh, Super Mario and only 2D, and that was the best we had. But today we have 3D imaging and a good assessment of the information the CT scan delivers us. And we can also use the, the 3D imaging, 3D videoing to see the fracture, to play around, check the fracture characteristic and make up our plan. So this is just an example. This is easily done. The radiologist does it for you. Play around and have a look um, and understand the fracture. And also there's the tool of 3D printing if you have time enough um, before the surgery, it gives you a good overview of the fracture and also the haptic understanding is something really important to, to have the fracture in your hand, uh, then it's easier to understand, especially in, in more complex cases like this, uh, like a crush injury of the forearm um, e-biker um, of a 40 year old woman. This is gives a good overview of the fracture and a good um, chance to understand what to do. And of course, there is the assessment needed of the ligament insertion and the biomechanical units. You have to think in biomechanical units. You have to know where the ligaments are, where they insert. And this led Greg Bain in 2013 to this um, publication where he showed the overall cortical breaches of the fracture and the fracture patterns. So they are almost always these type of uh, fracture uh, lines, not in every fracture, of course, but if you search for, for key fragments, think in these lines and these units, then you will interpret the, um, the, the fracture uh, correctly and interpret the biomechanics of the fracture and what you need to do. This led um, Wolfgang Hintringer to his classification you see the exact same line um, and the um, key fragments in red here. And we are talking about the uh, indications for dorsal uh, approach at the moment. So this is in the middle in the upper line. It could be also on the right and in, in the upper line and the middle in the lower line and also on the, on the right-hand side of the lower line. So these type of fractures may be needed to be fixed from the dorsal aspect of the of the radius, and then as Pascal already said, the four corner concept, this, which is a combination of Richter and uh, column um, classification or column model and Malone's four part classification. You have seen this already. I don't want to go in details, but only to show you uh, the classification. You have to add your fracture to one of these classification types, read it, interpret it, and the red part of these, um, of the fracture types indicated here, they need to be fixed. Th these are loose parts. So think of these units, think of, of the fixation of these units. And identify the need of dorsal plating. There is a lot of volar plating, which is easily uh, and uh, could be easily done. Uh, without any problem, but you need to identify the, the dorsal plating or the dorsal plates. Indications, Pascal talked already, but I want to add something more. Uh, Barton's fracture, complex intraarticular fractures, of course, um, dorsal ulnar corner fragments, dorsal comminution of cortical fragments, and large metaphysial defect zone, which require support. And of course, like uh, already mentioned, carpal lesion, concomitant carpal lesions, which can be assessed from the dorsal um, approach easier. So we are talking about these type of, of fractures here, B3, this is loose, 
B4 and B6 and also C. And the need of dorsal buttress is something I want to emphasize on. Um, if you have a, a locking head screw in your plate, this is like a pivot point. And if you add the force um, of your key fragment on the tip of the screw, you have a lot of moment arm and you can easily ruin your pivot point. So this is something you have to, you have to keep in mind when fixing a fracture and catching dorsal fragments with your volar uh, plate and volar screws, this can lead to insufficient fixation. Like in this case, um, this was done also in another hospital uh, without any additional imaging preoperatively. And this led to this in, uh, insufficient fixation because the surgeon said, okay, I'm going to do it from the volar aspect of the radius and he had no plan B. And this is what I want to emphasize on, have your plans ready during the surgery. There are different implants which can be used on the upper left corner, it's the nail. I think it is an advantage, but uh, you don't have a lot of possibilities to fix, for instance, smaller fragments or even support the intermediate column uh, nicely. I'm not using this nail. Um, there are other implants here, but I think they are bulky. And um, on the right-hand side, they're quite bulky, even on the listus tubercle. The listus tubercle is a lot of times it's fragmented. You can take it away, but it's still a bulky implant. We use um, the Miratis plate, this P-shaped frame plate, um, locking head screws. There were also other implants from other manufacturers available in the, in the early 90s and, and uh, 2000s then, um, which had angular stable or locking head screws. But at the moment, this is the, the only one we use in, in our hospital. There are some general tips and tricks. Um, these are basic ones. When you drill, put your fingers on the opposite side and feel the K-wire, the drill, and you don't want to feel the tip of the of the K-wire uh, inside the soft tissue, but you, you aim at your finger and this is something um, you can easily uh, apply for the direction of the drill. You aim for your finger and this is a good, good way to place the, the K-wire or the screw. Then oscillating versus forward, for, forward full speed. Um, somebody likes to use the oscillating but I think forward full speed gives a, a good, um, good drive forward. And it's, it's only a small uh, application of heat. Uh, oscillating can also um, apply some heat. So that's why you need to irrigate while drilling. And what I don't do is um, inserting K wires into the fracture, into the bone without any incision of the skin. And another one is the intraoperative setup. This is what we use, horizontal traction on the index and ring finger and some, um, uh, some cloth underneath the fracture um, to, to have a good support. And while you're using this one, the, the fracture can be reduced already in this position, but you have to be careful not to apply a pronation failure and too much destruction. That's why your resident um, needs to pronate the forearm while the, during the surgery while fixing the fracture. Some words for the approach. Mark your approach on the skin. Um, my left index finger is um, on the radius, on the radial styloid. Then open up, identify the third extensor compartment. Um, then move the EPL tendon aside and identify the PIN. We always go for the neurotomy of the PIN. It can be caught in the fracture and cause pain and cause CRPS-like problems. Then um, free the, the second extensor compartment. And then the fourth one, we almost 
always do an atrotomy because when you go from the dorsal uh, aspect of the radius, there are all may, always, always intraarticular fractures. Um, and you can easily assess these type of um, fragments. This is the radio trichateral tr ligament um, underneath the forceps. Um, you have to be aware not to cut it. Um, you have to open up the, the carpus and the arthrotomy along the radio triquetral ligament. Then you inspect the articular surfaces, search for concomitant carpal lesions, and go for the reposition of the fragments. You can use an elevating instrument like this. Um, and then for the frame plate, you need to adapt the frame plate a little bit. These ears need to be bent um, because they are they're too open to um, to to catch the the fragment and to give enough support. So that's why I, al I always uh, bend them a little bit, and you you can easily short these plates um, about two holes in distal very distal fractures. Of course, if there is more metaphysial or diaphysial. You don't go shortening the plate, of course. And then the position of the plate is, is um, very important. This is a sort of dorsal watershed line where my forceps are. Um, it's just close, very close to the listus tubercle um, where to place this frame plate and then fix it in the, in the long holes um, with some cortical screws. This is the situation after the fixation only in the long holes. Take some x-rays and, and fluoroscopy. And it is really necessary to have a clear view. In this view, you can judge if it's OK or not. But you don't have a good view inside the DRUJ. And if you have the DRUJ very um, clear and, and open, you can see the exact position of the plate. So this plate is a little bit too much on the radial aspect of the radius. Then I, I start with the intermediate column. Um, I fix it either in the direction of the screw holes of the plate um, or even straight. It depends on the fracture of, of the dorsal ulnar corner. And then I take another fluoroscopy. And in this case, you're still able to move the plate when loosening the, the screws and the long holes. And then you can give a little bit more of destruction of the, of the fracture. It's still possible before fixing the, the plate completely. And some words for the fl fluoroscopy, you need to elevate the arm in both planes to see the um, articular surface and the the screw placement. So you need to elevate the arm uh, about 20 to, to 25 degrees um, on the lateral aspect and the dorsal DP, it's, it's about uh, 15 to 20 degrees to have a clear view like here of the articular surface, the screw uh, direction and on the lateral side, this is the view you normally have of the plate and more distal aspect of the radius. But to see the articular surface, you have to elevate the arm a little bit and focus on the joint. With this fixation, I showed you before, we caught the um, volar ulna corner fragment because it was large enough. And also it was large enough not to sit on the tip of the screw. So this was possible and it healed afterwards. When closing, if you're happy with your fracture fixation, when closing, I want to show you um, how to protect your tendons and how to avoid any complications regarding the tendon gliding over the, over the plate. So first, of course, close the Atrotomy only with a few stitches. They don't have to be too tight, otherwise uh, it will lead to a flexion uh, deficit. Then 
take the second extensor compartment, elevate a small flap on the distal aspect of the second extensor compartment, pull this flap underneath the ECRL, ECRB tendon, and just fix it on top of the plate. So the tendons of the second extensor compartment are protected and glide smoothly over the plate. And it's always the problem of the distal aspect of the plate. This is the final situation. The second and fourth extensor compartment are closed and the EPL tendon is left um, where, where it is. I don't reconstruct the third extensor compartment. And some do's and don'ts. This was about 20 years ago, a reverse Barton-like -like fracture um, of the distal radius fixed with some small plates um, from the volar and dorsal aspect of the, of the distal radius. And this is what happened a few years ago uh, in, in my hospital. A lot of metal inside, almost the same fracture type, but um, fixed with the long volar plate. Um, it wasn't really necessary to do, to do it with a long uh, volar plate and a, a dorsal plate, a large dorsal plate, which was fixed in this way, but there are still some problems with the, with the hardware, which can easily cause irritation of the PIN and the first extensor compartment, and it can easily generate a CRPS type two. So be aware how, how to fix your plate and bend the plate perfectly, um, and, to not to cause any problems. And finally, if you don't have a plan A or the, the plan A doesn't work or the plan B doesn't work and you're not sure how to continue, then use the external fixator and let somebody else do the fracture. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think we can now go for the questions. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, so far, I have um, one question from the audience to you, Pascal. Uh, the question is, how do you close the dorsal retinaculum in a dorsal approach? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> that's actually a difference between uh, uh, me and, and Philip because um, the, the frame plate that Philip uses uh, incorporates the second and the fourth uh, compartment. I don't think, Philip, you uh, you, you leave the EPL just where it is, is that correct? Yeah, um, where it glides over the second extensor compartment. But in your case, I think um, it's, it's a little bit dif different. Yes, because we uh, do this fragment specific fixation in which we uh, approach the dorsal intermediate column uh, subperiostally underneath the fourth extensor compartment. So we, we leave that as it is. And since we do not open or do not go underneath the second extensor compartment, we do not close the retinaculum. So we do not do a retinacular flap between the plate and the second extensor compartment, uh, simply due to the fact that we do not open uh, the second extensor compartment. And uh, since we stay underneath the periost in the fourth extensor compartment, we don't do it there either. So in fact, we do not close it uh, at all. And, um, in the 212 cases we reviewed regarding complications, we haven't seen uh, any significant problems with that. So we'll keep on doing that. All right, I, I don't have a question in the chat. Uh, so everyone, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat function. Can I, can um, I ask a question? But yeah, so for um, the moment, I would like to ask you to maybe uh, comment each other's presentations. Yes, uh, thank you very much because um, it, it's a different uh, technique than uh, I, I emphasized on, especially since you use the, the frame plate. What is your experience in the need to remove this plate? Is that something you do standard or is it uh, on indication? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, in the former years, uh, when I started, it, it was an obligation to remove the, the hardware. Um, irrespectively of any problems the patient had. Um, it was said that 
um, they can cause problems. The plates, the plates can cause problems, so they need to be removed. Um, during the last years, I tend to ask the patients if there's if there's any problem, um, if there are any problems clinically during examination and uh, radiologically, radiologically, and then I remove them. But it's not an obligation really to remove them. Sometimes it's necessary because there is, as you said already, there are some disadvantages. And sometimes um, if you close the, the capsule too tight or if there's any scar um, formation of the capsule, there is a lack of flexion. And then you need to do, uh, need to go for the, um, uh, arthrotomy again and do some arthrolysis and tenolysis as well. And then you, of course, remove the plate. But that's because you use the, the tenolysis as an adjunctive to the plate removal and it makes the yeah, decision easier. Absolutely. And then, absolutely. And I realized that we, um, the indications are, of course, the fracture patterns are always the same according to the four corner concept, but. Um, we have the, the, the fragment specific plates, we have them in our sets, but we, we rather use them because it, when we use the dorsal approach and the dorsal um, osteosynthesis, there's always a need for, for, for buttressing and, and yeah. always a need to address both columns. And that's why I'm more keen to use them. But in your cases, you used for the, for the radial column, the fragment specific plates and for the intermediate uh, the in intermediate column plate. So that's the difference, yeah. but you address yeah. with the, both techniques, both columns are addressed. I agree. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So we have some more um, questions in the chat. Um, Philip, you were already mentioning the XFIX uh, in your presentation as a last result, um, but um, do you see a, a, a primary um, indication to use the XFIX? Yeah, I'm, I'm from the school of Daniel Rickley and um, in complex cases and um, you don't want to, you don't want to enter the OR during night times. And sometimes it's really necessary to wait for soft tissue, um, soft tissue uh, degrade, um, uh, swelling down and uh, then you need to have a fix, external fixator or in case you're not experienced enough I want the team to apply uh, an X-fix and not, not playing around during nighttime with a fracture. Um, then, it's, then there is an indication, but just for the, the complexity of the fracture to apply a fix X and then go for the definite treatment like a rule, I don't have this rule anymore. I think most of the cases, they are solvable during daytime. Some of them, of course, during nighttime, but most of them are, are solvable during daytime when you are in, in good state and then, then it's good to do it. In luxation of the, of the carpus, it's something different, of course. If there's instability and if there is um, um, a problem with neurology, you can apply an X fix and see how it evolves. But in many cases, I just go for the surgery then directly. Pascal, how is your? Yeah, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, as, you, as you saw in my presentation, we uh, we use this uh, in about four percent of cases, which is usually an external fixator, and in, in a rare occasion, an internal fixator. And uh, I work in a level one trauma center, so sometimes the distal radius fracture is part of uh, of the uh, pattern of injuries of the patient, and you don't, don't you do not want to lose too much time initially with a complex fracture fixation. So yes, it's a tool we sometimes for specific indications, which can be patient specific or doctor specific, if you know what I mean, uh, the, the, the external fixator is a nice tool for your primary fixation. I totally agree, yeah. Okay. And Pascal, um, if there is a need of a bone graft, uh, would you prefer an autograph or an allograft? Yeah, that's a good question because um, uh, we did a, a review recently on the need for uh, a bone graft in primary repair of distal radius fractures, and there is no scientific evidence for that. Uh, uh, having said that, there is no improved functional outcome or a better uh, uh, restoration of the radiological parameters um, doing that, but there can be some indications. 
in which mechanical support of the articular surface is necessary. And a, a technique we use, and Philip does the same as so, is to make sure that your screws are placed quite subchondrally so the joint surface is, is supported. And in my experience, uh, that does not uh, make the need for uh, for bone graft then necessary. So it's in a extremely rare case that we do it. And if we do it, it's usually autograft. And I'm a big fan then in those cases to use the iliac crest. But as I said, it's it's very very seldom. So my short answer is no. Okay. Um, and how? How do you decide to do a volar or a dorsal plating? Is it uh, about dislocation, the size of the fragments, or is it a combination? Uh, it's a question for me. Um, not, not. Uh, yeah, you, you can take it. I can, I, I can start. Um, it's a combination of all factors. Uh, sometimes you are um, quite sure that you can solve it from either volar or dorsally. Uh, due to the fact that it's a single dislocated key fragment or there's a simple biomechanical advantage for one approach. But there are indications in which uh, we start dorsally and we notice that we cannot correct the, the volar cortex adequately or vice versa. And then we do have to decide intraoperatively to do an additional approach. What is important, however, is that one approach does not hamper the other one. So if you do a volar approach first and then use two long screws, in which you already fix the dorsal corner in an inappropriate position, you sh you, you're not able to do a nice reconstruction from dorsal. So be aware of the fact that everything that you do from one side, either being reconstruction or using two long screws, will have its influence on the other side. So keep all options open. And there are many cases in which we decide to do an additional dorsal volar approach. Yeah, so it's dependent on the fracture and dependent on how it's intraoperatively uh, is uh, reconstructed. Right, thank you. Let, let me add something to this comment. I absolutely agree. Um, it's also mandatory to have a stable volar cortex. And like you said already, the, the fulcrum ne needs to be in st uh, stable. And sometimes you just go in the OR and, and have fluoroscopy and then decide if it's stable enough. Uh, can I fix it from dorsal only? or do I need a volar buttress? And then, of course, you start with vol volar buttress and then reconstructing the, uh, the radius surface, uh, the articular surface. Yep. But I, I, I tend to go um, to do intraoperatively or just before I cut um, to do fluoroscopy to check for stability of the, of the volar cortex. Okay. Uh, Philip, next one, next question goes to you. Uh, do you see problems with the second extensor compartment since the plate lies uh, right beneath it? Now, with the re retinacular flap, not anymore. Um, there is a problem if you close the second compa uh, extensor compartment too tight. Of course, then it's tightness and synovitis. But direct uh, mechanical uh, problems uh, on the tendons of the second extensor compartment, no. Not anymore. Okay. And maybe next one to Pascal. Um, when uh, when you perform dorsal only fixation, do you mobilize immediately or rest in plus the splint at all? Yeah, I, had, I could use a quote from Swanson, our famous uh, hand surgeon, who says that operative treatment of fractures uh, followed by immobilization in the plaster cast is, is the worth of both worlds. And that is my, that's my, uh, I totally agree with that. So if you do take the effort to do a fragment specific fixation and you fix all involved corners and you make sure that you do the best to do a, uh, um, as anatomically possible reconstruction, you should not give the patient the disadvantage of a plaster cast immobilization longer than it takes for the wound to heal. So a maximum seven to 10 days, that's it. And then uh, if it's any way possible, immediate functional health treatment. Do you agree, Philip? Yes, absolutely. Sometimes you need uh, thermoplastic splinting, but only for, for have the, the first days, um, the, the soft tissue conditioning, but um, you start in the hand therapy. And of course, this is what I didn't mention. And during the talk, this is not a tip and trick, it's a must. Uh, 
to in, in, involve the hand therapy early and start moving uh, movement out of the thermoplastic splint or even out of the brace um, as soon as it's, it's possible to move. Um, sometimes in very complex fractures, um, they need to be immobilized a little bit longer, like 10, 12, or, uh, 14 days, but it's, it's rarely the case that, it, that you don't move at all. Uh, next one is a uh, more general question, maybe also to both of you, um, about the spanning plates. Do you use them uh, at all? I can start. Uh, it's, it's nice because in the old days, the reconstruction of the joint didn't have a, a specific indication. So it was usually uh, uh, to keep length and to make sure that alignment was okay. So the technique was introduced quite a while ago, but came in popular due to the fact that we have all these anatomically perfect uh, fragment specific plates in which we do everything to correct the articular surface uh, in a, a fantastic fashion if we can. But I've encountered recently some cases in which that is quite impossible. So we are back again and um, using them for more indications. So I think we've used two or three in the past months. So we're getting um, more enthusiastic in some cases to use them. So it's sort of a, a shift in ways to think about fractures. Mm -hmm. What about you, Philip? Do you use uh, spanning plates? No, personally, I didn't. I did not yet. Um, in the team, yes, uh, especially in elderly patients with uh, very comminute, comminuted fractures. This is really valuable, but uh, I'm absolutely a fan of reconstructing uh, the, 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 the distal radius articular surface as long as, as it makes sense, of course. Uh, but um, if there is the need in the future um, in very complex cases, I have this tool ready, but I did not use it so far. All right. Um, last question for the moment. Um, do you use preoperatively, so temporarily, um, K wires and for which indications? Maybe Pascal, you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> uh, preoperatively, you mean? Uh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> I'm, I'm a. Uh, my fractures look like Mikado, you know, that uh, game with all the small sticks. Uh, so I, I use them for temporary fixation uh, because I think it's it's not always very easy to, to do the recon reduction on the plate itself, especially for complex intraticular distal raised fractures. That's quite impossible. So I make sure that my fragments are reduced and uh, uh, fixed temporarily, and then I replace the KYs by the material that stays in plate and screws. Uh, and sometimes if the KY has an additional function, I will switch it for a for a screw. Uh, so I often use the handset as an addition because 2.5 screws are often too large to uh, use for small fragments. And I sometimes use the speed tip screws, which are 1.5. Uh, uh, and if you use the 1.2 K wires, um, that's nicely pre-drilling for your screws. So yes, I do a lot. I put a hook on it, <laughs> the same. And uh, we started using these speed tip screws as well. And I'm really, I, I like them um, very much because in those fragments, in those small fragments, you don't want to drill around. Uh, otherwise they, they break um, or even use uh, smaller screws um, from the handset and fix, especially the dorsal, dorsal fragments, the smaller distal dorsal fragments. Um, and K-wiring, as I said, only with skin incisions. Obviously, we use them via the approach we uh, primarily used. And uh, one small addition, uh, I also do the primary fixation sometimes with speed tips and just leave them in because it's a very mm. uh, handy tool. You don't need to pre-drill it. They're uh, uh, perfect to do your reduction. And uh, uh, due to the fact that they're just 1.5, mm. You can leave them in if they are placed um, strategically because that's a problem often you place your k-wire in a such a strategic position that uh, there's no room anymore for additional screws so that's the reason i love the speed tips thank you very much um for the moment there are no more questions in the chat so um i would like to leave the last words for the two of you 
if you have any additional comments. Yeah, one thing, one last thing. I noticed, Philip, that you do a denervation of the pin in most cases or in every case. Is that is that your policy? And uh, is that because you do an arthrotomy uh, and that makes it necessary? Can you elaborate on that shortly? Um, yeah, we had cases of uh, treatment of, of PINs in the fracture and even um, unforeseen problems um, due to neuromas as well. Um, not, not many, but um, I don't want any CRPS-like trigger, and that's why I, I just take it off. I think Elizabeth Haggard, if she was, would listen, listen to my words, she would take, cut off my ears, but um, I haven't seen any proprioceptive problems so far. Uh, we, we cut this nerve, and the patient doesn't tell you that he doesn't move his or her hand or doesn't know where the position of the of the wrist is um and i haven't seen any problems so far proprioceptive wise if we can really address this clinically but um but from the from the nervous aspect and from the pain aspect we had some problems and that's why it's a pol it's, it's it's a policy I have the same experience with all salvage procedures in which we do a PIN denovation, and I've never seen uh, significant uh, uh, problems with that. So I totally agree, but we do not do it primarily for the fractures. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's yeah. good to know. Philip, any uh, other comments from your side? No, uh, I just want to emphasize once more about this four corner concept and the position of the lunate. Just on this as a final word, uh, if you interpret a CT scan, check the position of the lunate and you will find your way to the key fragment. Okay, so um, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Philip and Pascal, for your presentations and the valued input. Thank I you. hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel over the next couple of days. I wish everyone a pleasant evening and uh, watch out for upcoming upcoming events at the Medardis webinar Wednesday. The next one will take place on May 5th about fracture specific plate selection and operative strategies of tricky distal radius fractures. Um, so thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Helena, for, for organizing this webinar. You're thank so you welcome. Much. Yes, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much both.